She's never clapped before, she always clap after. <laughs> Has anyone ever heard of a Reuben? Anyone heard of a Reuben? <clears throat> the people had Reubens last night. A Reuben is a, a toasted sandwich. <laughs> a toasted sandwich that has um, um, corn meat or silver side that's been slow cooked overnight. Heard of that? And uh, it has all different sort of uh, herbs and all those sort of things and then you shred the, the silver soil as my kids call it when they're young, suicide <laughs> and, and, um, and then you put it on a lovely sort of whole grain bread and with uh, sauerkraut and pickles and Swiss cheese and coleslaw and a bit of mustard on top and a bit of salt and pepper <clears throat> then you put it into a sandwich press and press it down and you have what's called a Reuben with a pickle. Well, um, we had that last night and um, I've had it again for breakfast this morning, I think. <laughs> and I think I'm having it for morning tea right now. <clears throat> but anyway, let's see how we go. It was very nice at the time, but we've realised <clears throat> as a... a as we're getting older, but you have to eat before 4.30. <laughs> and not 7.30 at night. Because <laughs> I was still up at 2.30 this morning. Oh, stop now. <laughs> I wish I could stop. <laughs> but I can't. Anyway. This morning, um, I put up a, 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 the, an urgent message. And uh, I think it is an urgent message and um, I'm going to be reading from the book of Haggai. Um, only two chapters the book of Haggai but it's, um, it's interesting um, when you look at a chronological Bible it gives you a whole new perspective on reading the Word of God um, because um, Haggai and then uh, Zechariah the book after that all linked to, to the rebuilding of the temple. But then if you look at it further, um, the, the book of Ezra, which is way back in, the, in the, our original Bible, is linked to, um, to the book of Haggai and the book of Zechariah. So when you see a chronological Bible, it shows you um, the, the, the different verses that are relating in timelines. And the timelines are very, very important. So what does the book of Haggai say to us? I'll, I'll, first of all, I'd like to give you a bit of an overview of the, uh, I suppose, what's happening at this time. So the Jews have returned from exile in Babylon and to their homeland, and they had faced, or were facing at that time, intense opposition. And they were facing the opposition both internally and externally. Never think that opposition is just ex external. There's often internal. Families, friendships, yourself. And these people were known as the remnant. Their enemies first attempted to infiltrate the ranks of the builders when they were told to rebuild the temple. It's interesting, the devil knows who to target. So he, he tried to infiltrate. Now that's an interesting thing, infiltration. We're seeing it on the rise these days. Um, infiltration into businesses and families and <coughs> pardon me, governments. But it didn't work. So they then resorted to scorn and threat. And the interesting thing is, <clears throat> at this time, <clears throat> pardon me, God sent both Haggai, the prophet, and he also sent Zechariah, the prophet. I, I don't know 
how often that happened, uh, I haven't looked this up, but I think that's quite unique. You know, he sent both Haggai that's just, and Zechariah. And the interesting thing is that Haggai just didn't give a prophetic message and then move on or whatever. Haggai was there and he stayed with them. And I think uh, he gave a, a, around five or six messages because in the book of Haggai, it even gives you the dates of when he gave these different messages. So he's there keeping them aligned and keeping them in check as they were going along. See, the thing was that they had started to rebuild the temple when they came back from the, their exile, but then it quit because of the opposition and harassment. And in the, in the book of um, Ezra, in chapter 5, I'll just skip back through to that, it says, then, he, then with a show of strength, they forced the Jews to stop building. This is the people there, the, um, not part of the remnant. So the work on the temple of God in Jerusalem had stopped and it remained at a standstill until the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. At that time, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to the Jews in Judea and Jerusalem. They prophesied in the name of God of Israel who was over them. So that's back in Zechariah. So it was a 10 year lapse between the time when they started and they stopped so what did they do in that 10 years? Well, they forgot about building the temple and they reverted instead to their own pleasures. Which for the devil, more, by the way, was very happy that they did that. So what happened is that their priorities had, had shifted and now they were reaping the consequences here in, in Haggai. Haggai's word from God was uh, challenging basically their priorities. So that's an overview of where we're at at the moment in this book of Haggai. So this is where the people were at. In Haggai chapter 1 verses 3 to 7 it says this, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, It is time for you yourselves to live Sorry, I'll say that. It's time for you, you yourselves to live in your expensive, uh, expensive penalty houses while the house of the Lord, or the temple, lies in ruin. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. You have planted much, but have harvest, harvested little. You eat, but you do not have enough to eat. You drink, but you don't have enough to be intoxicated. Your clothes... You clothe yourself, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns wages earns them just to put in a bag with holes in it because this is because God has withheld his blessing. And then verse 7 it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. Now, hold on, didn't I just read that back in... Chapter 5, uh, uh, sorry, verse 5. Consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. And then in verse 7 he says, Consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. I think he might be trying to get their attention. Basically what God was saying was, I know you've heard the saying, wake up and smell the roses. Look what's happening. Can't you see it? Can't you see what's happening because of your behaviour? Twice, he says, consider your ways. He wanted them to reflect. He wanted them to reflect on the decisions that they had made. So what they had done is they had stopped uh, building the temple of God and reverted back instead to their own pleasures, panelling their houses, making their houses expensive and beautiful and all these sort of things. Um, is that really happening in Haggai's time? It seems to be a little bit happening here. I can't believe, I really can't, I can't believe people with debt. That, that, that I'm, I, I, we're all being in debt, you know, you have a home. But the, the amount of debt people are putting themselves in, young people yeah. are putting themselves into today. And they're, they're tinkering on the edge and, and so with the interest rates rising, all this stuff, they're in all sorts of trouble. Consider your ways. 
What's God saying to us? What's God saying to you individually? It's a really important question that we should ask ourselves. God, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to be? What do you want us to be involved in? A statement I'm going to get. Our circumstances will never prove favourable to our priorities. Our circumstances will never prove favourable to our priorities. Making time for them takes a choice. See, the thing is that we can always make excuses. We can always justify why we're doing it. But is God convinced? I can say something, I can say something very convincing to Cheryl, and she can believe because I'm so convincing with my, my argument, but it, does that make it right? Does it make it true? See, God said to them to Haggai, consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. Matthew 6.33 says, but first and foremost, importantly, seek, aim at and strive at his kingdom, that's God's kingdom, and his righteousness, his ways of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things will be given to you also. That's Jesus saying that. Basically, what it, you know, make sure that you've got the right priorities. See, for us as believers, I'm, I'm not using the word Christian anymore because it's, it's lost its meaning. Yeah. Yeah. But us as believers in Christ, living out our priorities remains and always will be an act of faith. Because there will never be an ideal time. What um, was said this morning in tithe by Kathleen, Today, today, everything around about us is saying we shouldn't give. Everything around us is saying we shouldn't give. I'm going, you don't know, Ross, you don't know the circumstances I'm going through. You, Ross, you don't know how hard it is because my, my energy bill has just gone up 50% and it's going up another 25% in June. You don't know um, uh, the body corporate fees have got. Yes, I do. I know all these things. But there's only one solution, one answer, and the world hasn't got it. God's Word has got it. But it's not easy. And I don't think God wanted it to be easy. I think God wants us to, to push through. He wants us to, to persevere. And most of all, He wants us to seek Him. Amen. Not our bank balance. In coming times, it is critical that we seek God. Yeah. Constantly seeking Him, out, seeking out His plan, His purpose, and His priorities for you. Not worrying about anybody else, but what's God's plan, purpose, and priority for you? Because what will be for John will be different what it will be for David. And what will be for David will be different for Lisa. What for Lisa will be different to Vic. It's, God has got a plan. It's all part of the jigsaw, but we've all got a part to play. All of us. And we'll see that shortly. And it's not building a life around me and my needs. And that's the subtlety of the enemy. That's the subtlety of the... And we're getting sucked into this vortex. Sucked in of, you know, by popular opinion, now the reason that we, that um, Sharon, Bob and, and Cheryl and I ate later than we normally do last night and causing the consequences of my indigestion was we were watching this video and it was a video by <coughs> Gary Hemrick called the, a, a Biblical Response to the Transing of America. If you haven't watched it, you need to. Sorry, you don't need to. I suggest that you do. Uh, <clears throat> a biblical response to the transing of America. It, it should be, it's a wrong title, it should be a biblical response to the transing of the Western world. Yeah. Yeah. Because what he was saying there is happening here and 
and and it wasn't just, it was talking about how how America has transitioned from here to here and all the things that are going on in between. And because we got so engrossed in that, we had our meal later. But it was a wonderful th it was a wonderful uh, wake up call to us to, to what's going on in this world, and in particular the Western world. I don't think Christians in Iran are worrying about their homelands. I don't think the people in Ghana and different places where terrible atrocities are happening to Christian people and children are worrying about their homelands. Or the price of electricity, they just don't have any. See, in Haggai chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Go up to the hills, or the hill country, bring lumber, and rebuild my house, the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord, accepting it as done for my glory. Now, the hill country or the mountains, they have quite a significant meaning biblically. You find throughout scripture people going up to the mountains or up to the hill country. Why do they do that? To go into the presence of God. They go up into the presence of God. That's why the devil wants the high country. If you don't already know that, he wants the high country because he knows that's where people need to go to get into the presence of God. So he says, go up into my presence. That's what it's going to go up to the hill country and bring lumber. You don't go up to the hill country in the last days and stay there. Sorry. You bring it back down. You get the lumber and you bring it back down. The lumber, what is he talking about the lumber? The lumber is get your resources from God. Go up into his presence. Get what you need from him, your resources, your equipping, and come back down to be fulfilling his plan and his purpose. I've got a question for you. Have you a hill or mountain place? where you go to seek God for guidance and direction for your life and, and for your family? Have you got a place where you go away, you get away from the distractions, you get away from the, inter the, the interruptions? That quiet place, it could be in your bedroom. It could be on the beach. It could be going for a drive in the country. It could, but have you got a place where you get away from all those things that are going to draw you or try to draw you away from the presence of God. Because that's all the devil wants to do. He wants to draw you away from the presence of God. In Haggai 1 verses 9 to 10, so carrying on from verse 8, it says, You look for much harvest, but it comes too little. And even when you bring that home, I blow it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts. Because my house, the temple, which lies in ruins, while each of you runs to your own houses, eager to enjoy it. Therefore, because of you, that is your sin and disobedience, the heavens withhold the dew and the earth withholds its produce. Doesn't hold back, does it? He's not saying that we can't have nice things, okay? That's not saying. It's not saying you can't have a nice home, or anything, but it's saying, where's your priority? What's, what's your, you can even put it in a new way instead of priority, what's your idol? Ooh, Ross. Idol? I don't have idol. Yes, we do. Sorry, we do. Anything that we put in front of God is an idol. A thought to ponder. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17 says, Are you not aware that you, 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 are you not aware that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the, the temple of God is holy 
which temple you are. So if you take that scripture and put it into Haggai, the temple lies in ruin. You need to rebuild, God's saying to rebuild the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It says it there quite plainly. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Pardon me. What are you doing? Are you building yourself? Are you equipping yourself? Are you building yourself in the ways of God? It's not talking necessarily about a physical building, but it's talking about us as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Where are you? Where is your position in, in, in Christ? Where, is you, where are you at in your walk with God? See, it comes down to choices. And it comes down to our priorities. So, that's my introduction. An urgent message to the Western Church. The consequences of disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Yeah. My personality type is that I'm a procrastinator. I've had to work on that for many, many, many decades. Cheryl used to nickname me next week. <laughs> and the reason she used to call me next week was because she'd asked me to do something and I'd say, yeah, yeah, I'll do it next week. Then she bought a whiteboard and she used to put on the, the list of all the tasks, little duties, little things, that, chores that she'd like me to do, you know. So I'd see these list of things mount up and then I'd get a real spurt on one day and get a real you know, feeling of pain of embarrassment or whatever it may be and I, I'd go and I'd wipe off about five of these suckers. You know, and, and I felt really proud about myself and I'd go downstairs and I'd come back up and to my dismay there was another four things written up. <laughs> so I got smart. I didn't rub them off. <laughs> but we need to take or do a stock take or an inventory on ourselves with God. I don't know if you know what a stock take is, but it's basically checking the state of play in regards to your resources and all that sort of thing, inventory. And so we do, we need to, you know, we need to make sure that we are clean, we're ready and equipped. And so that we're ready for whatever we need to deal with uh, and whatever confronts us ahead of time. And, and to be quite honest, we are going to be confronted with things in the future. I might say the near future. Are we ready? Okay, so what's the turning point? And what was the turning point for the remnant church in Haggai's time? Well, in Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, it says, Then Zerubbabel, no one goes through his son of, and then Jeshua, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God, began to obey the message from the Lord. So it wasn't just Zerubbabel who was like the governor. It wasn't just Joshua who was the high priest, but it was the, the, them and it says the whole remnant of God began to obey. They obeyed the message from the Lord their God. When they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent, the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. Previously, what did he do? He said, I have with, withheld my blessing. Now, because they began to obey, now it didn't say they, they the people began they started the process. They started the process. And once they started the process, God said, good, I'm with you. I'm with you now. All you have to do is take that step 
That's all you have to do. You didn't have to go the whole way. I'll be with you. All I needed to see was it that you were willing to go. And then verse 14. If you remember nothing else that I've said today, or what I say, remember this verse. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, the governor of Judea, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God, they began to work on the house or the temple of their God, the Lord of Heaven's army. Okay, obedience was the key. But see what it says here? The Lord sparked. It only takes a spark. It only takes a spark of the Holy Spirit. We want the whole damn bushfire. But God says a bushfire starts with a spark. spark. Where's my mechanic friend over here? You know a bit about cars? Just a little? How important is a spark plug? On a petrol. Very. Not diesel. <laughs> But a spark in the old days, I'm going back in age, but you know, we used to get and you'd take the spark plugs out and you'd clean them and everything because if you didn't have a spark in the spark plug, didn't matter what you did, you could have the car full of petrol, full of you know, oil and all sorts of stuff, but if you didn't have a spark, it didn't work. See, the Holy Spirit starts the process with a spark. You, oh, I've been watching a few... Um, things on people sort of uh, going out into the country and they've got very little resources, no matches, no nothing, and they've got this little flint to start a fire. So they gather their little, you know, little bits of twigs and all sorts of stuff and they've got this flint and they flint and it sparks and it starts this little fire. And then they put their other stuff on and the elf goes and the elf goes and the next minute they've got a fire. Keep them warm and to cook and all those different things. But it only started with a spark. See, the car is, is, is started. You can make sure the car is full of petrol. The car is ready, fully checked and serviced. That's the preparation. And then what you have to do is put yourself behind the wheel. Then you turn the ignition. Then the spark of the spark plug, or whatever happens, whatever that modern cars do these days. But the spark starts. But we have to prepare and we have to be positioned. If we're not prepared and we're not positioned, it doesn't matter what, it won't work. The car won't work unless we're in the, in the driver's seat. People say, well, I shouldn't be in the driver's seat. Yeah, you should. I like to think that God is in the passenger seat navigating us where we should go. But he, doesn't, he won't do it all for us. It starts with a spark. So what does the devil attempt to do? What's his plan today? What's the devil's plan? Five things. He is trying to, he is trying to deceive, divert, deflate, defeat, and destroy us. He's trying to deceive us. Doing a pretty good job of that. Of the world. He's deceiving the world. He wants to divert us, divert our thinking, the way that we should think. I heard a very disturbing thing the other day. Uh, a man who used to be a man of God, who is not now, his name is Andy Stanley in America, and he's got a, for Pride Month, he's got this um, person, this transgender person, as part of his staff. To assist people who are going down that track. Totally deceived. Being diverted off the main road onto this old ruckety you know, track. He then tries to deflate us. Deflate us. Just get us downhearted and should we keep going? We've done all this stuff, but nothing seems to be working. The government aren't changing their the same way. We're deflated. 
Then whilst we're deflated, we get defeated. Ah, oh, I don't think I'll do this anymore. Just go to the movies. Go to the beach. And people think it stops there. He's defeated us, but he wants to go one step further. He wants to destroy us. See, we can be deceived, diverted, deflated and defeated and still come back. But when he destroys us, there's no coming back. So why have I said all this? Well, I was reading the book of Haggai in my reading. And I think it was a good thing because I'd started my message for today some weeks ago uh, because I need plenty of time because I'm getting old. And anyway, I started this message and I thought, oh, this is pretty good. And anyway, and the title of my message was Finishing Strong. And the example I was using was Caleb. And then I came to church on Sunday and our wonderful pastor put up a thing on the thing on, and it said, finishing strong. <laughs> and I let out the shell and I said, if he uses Caleb, I'm a goner. <laughs> and then what does he say? My example today is Caleb in the book of Joshua. So I had to go back to Lord. So on the 29th of May this year, I was reading the book of Haggai. As I said, it's only two chapters, so it wasn't a long read. And I believe God gave me an urgent message. In Haggai 2, verses 4 to 6, it says, But now the Lord says, Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. Remnant. And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord of heaven's army. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So don't be afraid. Verse 6, it says, For this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. In just a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. And you think, oh, well, Ross, that's, um, that's Old Testament. Yes. I thought you might say that. But in Hebrews, chapter 12, 26 says, When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth, but now he, made, he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only the unshakable things will remain. But he says, Zerubbabel, be strong. Leader, be strong. The high priest, be strong. And the remnant, all this, be strong. One, two, three. Not just the leaders, he says it to everybody. And he says, now get to work because I am with you. My spirit remains among you. All I'm going to do is give you a spark. Now get going. And then it says in verse 6, In just a little while I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I believe that God is sending us a message of preparation. The key points of preparation is number one, be strong. Number two, get to work. Number three, the Holy Spirit will be with us. And number four, in just a little while, things are going to start happening. And you think, okay. But then in Haggai 2, verses 21 to 22, he says again, he says, Tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones and destroy the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow their chariots and riders. The horses will fall and their riders will kill each other. And this is what God, I felt God showed me. In verse 6, it said, in just a little while. In verse 21, it says, I am about to. 
It's intensified. It's urgent. The urgency has increased in just a little while. Okay, but now he's saying, oh, I am about to. It's about to happen. And I felt God say, I've written it in my Bible, 29th to 5th, 20. And I've asked questions and I highlighted it because I felt there was a, a, a message from the Holy Spirit that it's not far off. I'm not, no dates. But it's, but, but one thing that God has shown Cheryl and I over the last 18 months, since nearly two years now, He's been showing us and teaching us the timings of God. It is just so critical, the timings of God. Not our time. Not other, but it's the God's timing. So what do I mean by God's timing? It's all about God's timing and being in a position to hear Him and to act in His time, not our own. Get yourself up into the hill country. Get yourself to that place. Let's hear individually what God is saying to us because I don't think it's far off. And he wants us to get to work in the meantime. Now it's interesting. I was typing this message uh, last Wednesday. And anyway, Cheryl had gone out. And I was typing out. And I, I just typed in here. I was just, this is, I'm, I'm not telling an untruth. In, 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 I saw in, the, in Parliament the other day, you're not allowed to say lie. You have to say not quite right. <laughs> uh, it, it says, um, I, I, I wrote this, I just stopped typing this sentence. It is about God's timing, being in a position to hear him and to act in his time, not our own. And the phone rang. And it was Cheryl. And she, she just spoke about... Um, while her conversation she met somebody for coffee and she said Ross we need to make sure we're in God's timing whoa <laughs> I'm just finishing typing that sentence and she says we need to make sure that we're in God's timing because we're talking about different things in our life and you know setting and it's all about the timings of God. Because if we're not in the timings of God, then it won't work. It won't happen. I believe that God is saying to us, His remnant church, for we are a remnant, but God works in the remnant. God works in the little things. These Four things, five things. What like that in Proverbs? My son hates that. Four, no five. Irritates him to the extreme. Anyway, that's good. Number one, we need to check our priorities. Number two, we need to be obedient to the call of God in our lives. Number three, position ourselves. To get prepared and be ready for what is about to happen. Be strong. Don't be afraid or intimidated. I was listening or watching a video of Brendan Holthouse the other day, and he was saying in his church they're, put a, they're putting in place um, for when digital currencies and all these different things are going to happen in digital IDs and they're trying to stop, you know, you can't go to the shops or do this or do that and you can't buy this or that. But they're, in their, in their um, church, they're putting together, um, you know, there's a, a guy who's come, he said, um, I've got beef cattle. The church can get their meat from me. And then there was a, a farmer and the farmer had this, he said, I'm growing this produce. And, and so what they're doing is they're, they're trying to become self-sufficient within their own little church. They're not an overly big church either, but they're putting things in place. Are we putting things in place in our own life? Are we right? Are we ready? When someone comes on the door, they see, oh, I can see what you're putting on social media. Well, they don't see it because I'm not on social media, but you know, I can see what you're looking at. I can see these sort of things. Uh, we don't like you sort of people. 
And if you think, oh, well, that's too far, that's, you know, that's, not, that's not really what's going on. I hate to revert back to Victoria, but in Victoria last year, a man was appointed to the Essendon Football Club as their CEO, and then he, got, he stood down because of his Christian faith, and the, the dictator of that state said, there is no room for people like this in our state. Well, what are they going to? What's he going to do if there's no room? What's he going to do about it? Obviously, he's got a plan. An evil one at that. But we need to check our priorities, be obedient to the calling of our God, position ourselves, get prepared, be ready for whatever's going to happen, and be strong. And don't be afraid or intimidated. And I believe the message is urgent. So, Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Father, Lord, if this is your word, Father, let it sink into the, our hearts and our spirits. Let us go out of this place today prepared and ready for whatever you have for us. In Jesus' name.